we welcome you back into the Dog Bowl here in Berea, getting you ready for Browns and Broncos. Sunday, 425, another 4 o'clock kickoff. Only a couple of them left before we go back to our regular 1 o'clock time slots. I'm Jason Gibbs alongside Nick Shook, Andrew Gribble, and our new guest uh, and guest host, John Greco, will join us, former Browns offensive lineman. Um, a man of many traits on the offensive line. <laughs> Is there a spot you didn't play? I did not play right tackle. I play. I had action in an NFL game at the other four, but right tackle, I can honestly say I never played in a NFL game. Maybe preseason, but not an actual okay. line, line bullets. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're happy to have you. And John will join us every week uh, on the best podcast available. Guys, uh, real quick, just a quick takeaway from you all on the on the loss to New England. Positive that you might take out of this game, out of that game, and something that we can look forward to here in these final nine games that we can build off of that game. Gribble, I'll start with you. Uh, the positive I'll take away is that your run defense has greatly greatly improved for one week, and I think that's been an issue for this team sporadically throughout the season. Obviously, San Francisco ran all over you. Seattle had a lot of success running the ball. The Patriots didn't. It was it was by far the best you did against the run, and I think that really had you not had that turnover stretch to start the game, you you were in for a pretty close back and forth game because you were shutting down that run. So that would that would be a positive. The the negative is the easy one. You had a, a stretch in the first quarter that was the worst stretch that you've had all all season. Went from zero to uh, went from three to seventeen in a hurry, and you, you can't. I mean, most teams you can't come back from a seventeen point deficit against. The Patriots, I mean, forget about it. You have to play perfect football from that point forward, and it's really hard to do. Nick? I, I think I would, you know, kind of piggybacking off of that was with the run defense was, uh, you know, being in the press conf- or in the press box and listening to uh, the New England Patriots beat reporters, they marveled at the fact that the Patriots couldn't really do that much offensively for the majority of the game. Now, they did go down the field thanks to uh, the long screen pass to James White and ended up scoring a touchdown to – put their lead back out to two touchdowns in the third quarter. But for a lot of that game, I just sat there and listened to them talk about how the Patriots offense just couldn't do much against this Browns defense, which is a credit to them. And, you know, you don't like to play the what if game, but if you do take away even two of those turnovers, that game is probably much more manageable and you're in it longer. Um, and, and, you know, I think that's good moving forward because you're not going to play a team of the caliber of the Patriots every week. So, uh, you know, maybe you'll get away with a mistake or two. Obviously you want to clean up the majority of them, but nobody's perfect. And, expecting to play perfect football is just unrealistic. So that's the positive. The negative, you know, it, you can't avoid the turnovers. I mean, the, you can't look anywhere else really than the turnovers. Um, and maybe not being able to take advantage of, of that last possession before halftime. But, you know, like Baker said yesterday, they got a penalty. It kind of put them in an unfortunate situation. You don't want to give the Patriots the ball back. So that's understandable. But there were opportunities, didn't take advantage of them, and also put yourself in too deep of a hole to climb out of. John? Yeah, I agree with you guys. And, uh, you know, I'll say – Flipping uh, sides of the ball, I'm going to talk about a little bit of uh, their run offense. I've uh, been impressed all year with the rushing attack, and it's been um, you know it's been positive for the most part. And uh, over 100 yards, I think they're averaging over what 110, I think now. Um, but that's that's a recipe for winning football. When you couple that with the improved rush defense that you guys were talking about, they can eliminate some of those. Uh, turnovers, some of the penalties. I think it's going to be a, a strong foundation to uh, put a great product on the field in this second half of the season. Is there something to be said um, that there were plays to be made offensively? And, you know, Todd Monken said it today, the offensive coordinator in his weekly press conference here. New England didn't change anything. They didn't really do anything different throughout the game. They didn't adjust. We had opportunities. We just didn't make them. Yeah, that's that's probably the most disappointing thing is as they all um, are, are you know had to look at this week. Um, you know, when a team's not changing, when they're not adapting, and you're you're still able to run the ball and do the things you're practicing all week, it makes it a little bit easier on you because you don't have to make those game time adjustments. But you know, when you're not making those big splash plays, those big opportunities that really you've executed all week in practice, you know that's that's how you fall a little bit short. So I know that they're um, just trying to keep attention to detail moving forward, and they're going to try to make those big plays this coming weekend. The, the Patriots only outgained the Browns by 18 yards, I yeah. think, that yeah. entire game. And that's just – that shows how – if the penalties are just killing you. I mean, they're just absolutely – like it's made almost every drive seem like an adventure, even the ones you score points on, because 
a, a lot of these drives where you have score points, you have had to overcome penalties to do so. You almost need these big plays just to get first downs. And it's those drives where you move the ball and you don't have any penalties. It really stands out. They're like, oh, that was that was a lot easier than most of the other has been. And I think you had three offensive pass interferences in, in the game. Some were more questionable than others. Uh, but 13 penalties, you're not going to win, especially – we, you had that penalty disaster game to start the season, 18 penalties. A lot of those were the unsportsman likes, the emotional penalties. None of these, none of those 13 were this. These were just procedural uh, five yard, 10 yard at a time penalties, but those are enough to just uh, kill you and put you behind the sticks. And just there was that defensive drive where you, you kept giving them first downs with those penalties. And even though you didn't give up any points there, just put your defense on the field for way too long. And, you know, this is a trend. I mean, they they even there was a defensive drive against Seattle two weeks ago where they did the same thing, where they gave them multiple first downs as they moved the ball down the field and went down and scored. And it just really comes down to just discipline and execution, discipline in in not jumping off sides, except for the time when you're told to jump off sides, which that's understandable. Um, And execution, trying to run a rub route, but making contact with a defender three yards deep instead of one yard and getting flagged for it on an important play on third down where you would have picked up a good amount of yardage and moved the sticks. So... Uh, you hope that you can clean that up, but it's something that over time, you know, as it continues to crop up, you just you wonder, hey, when are we going to get this? When are we really going to hone in on this and focus and not make these mental errors? Because these games ahead, some of them should be winnable. Obviously, it's the NFL and, you know, the any given Sunday and everything else. But if you can get out of your own way, you should stack some wins together and start to turn the season around. It's just a matter of doing it. Speaking of quarterbacks, let's move on to the Denver Broncos, 2-6 and six on the football season, and uh, a team that has fallen on some hard times. Bradley Chubb, of course, out for the year with a torn ACL. I don't know how he played in the game and didn't know it was torn because I know when I tore my ACL, I felt <laughs> like I got shot. Um, not that I would know what that feels like, but I definitely couldn't walk, uh, much less play in the basketball game that I was currently playing in. So he's out. Now Joe Flacco out. And Brandon Allen set to make his debut. Here's a guy that's outside of preseason game, really hasn't taken any snaps in an NFL game. And with a new quarterback making his debut, while you get maybe a little excited as a Browns fan, the, 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 the guy, the, the analyst inside me says, Here's a guy we don't know anything about. What if he comes out and lights the world on fire? Uh, I, that's because there is no tape on him. And until there's tape on him, is that a situation that you've got to be very leery of going into the game? Yeah, I think so. Uh, you know, anytime you're playing a team that has their back against the wall and a lot of adversity in their building and surrounding their organization, you don't know what team you're going to get. Are you going to get the team that comes out firing on all cylinders, that's rallying behind a first time starting quarterback? Uh, or are you going to get a team that just can't handle the adversity and that's just going to keep sputtering? So you got to prepare that you're going to see a, a team that's undefeated. And, you know, with that being said, you know, you're going to see a game plan that's going to be quarterback friendly for them. So the easiest thing to do is disrupt him, hands in his face, hands in the throwing lanes, pressure, try to get him off of his game, off of his rhythm, because I guarantee you all week they're working on their running game, which has been successful. They're working on quick play action throws, kind of – you know, really um, quarterback-friendly, offensive-line-friendly plays. That way it takes a lot off his, his plate. And, you know, this is a, a team that is well-positioned to do that. You know, we obviously know what's on their roster up front, but they've really turned it up in the last, you know, couple weeks. Olivier Vernon is one specifically. Gribble wrote about it today. You can find it on clevelandbrowns.com. Uh, some PFF numbers that kind of illustrate where he's been. He was – way out of the top 10 or 15 in in some key categories. And then in the last two weeks, he's fourth in total pressures generated. He's tied for first in QB hurries. He's tied with his teammate, Miles Garrett. So, I mean, this is, you know, we're illustrating that this is not just a Vernon uh, effort. He's fifth, tied for fifth in the NFL in, in key plays in, in the pass rushing game. And, and he's tied for 28th in overall pass rushing grade, which is a far, far cry from where he was uh, in his first five weeks with the team so basically this this defensive front is really starting to figure it out they've also played really well against the run there's numbers that back that up as well so you think well if you stop that run and then you force it onto the shoulders of a guy who's never played you're setting yourself up for a pretty good day it's just as long as you can do that on a consistent basis and get after him early enough and not to let them hang around for too long let, let me talk about something that has nothing to do with the outcome of this game uh i was in attendance for brandon allen's starting college debut 
and I will be there for his NFL debut, which is maybe the lowest possible claim to fame <laughs> I can ever have. But I was in the building <laughs> when he was summoned to start for Arkansas for the first time as a freshman, 2012. Uh, you think he had some magic, maybe. Uh, he did not. Uh, he was 10 of 18, <laughs> 65 yards, two picks. They lost 52 to nothing. So what I'm saying is this is a tough spot for Brandon Allen to be in. He's been in the league, though, for four years. This is he, He's played a lot of preseason football. Uh, just hasn't played a lot with the Broncos. So this is something I, I get. We've we've been on the wrong end of some of these miracle starts that the the Browns have seen over the past few years. These guys making their starting debuts. That's I mean, this I is something it's fresh in the mind. It's just yeah. something you have to take advantage of. I mean, he he's been on the Broncos for two months. I mean, he he was he was added to the team after the preseason, so he didn't even play preseason uh, with the Broncos. They had to make a move because Drew Locke was hurt. I mean, you just simply have to take advantage of this, and this is for an offense that wasn't good with Flacco. I mean, so this is something you really have to go in and truly sell out against the run because that's what they're pretty good at. I wouldn't say they're great at it. And you've got to just take advantage of it and make it so this team has to play from behind because they're not they're they're not a good offense when the game's that close. And if they're if they're playing from behind, that that's when you can really pin your ears back. And that's kind of a, to that point, too. This is a team that with a front office that basically signaled, you know, two weeks ago that, hey, we know we really aren't going to do much this year. Uh, we're going to trade away our veteran receiver and try and get some assets for it as we move forward and give more exposure to our younger guys. Uh, I would imagine that they didn't expect uh, Brandon Allen to be included in that, but they do have two really good running backs who are promising, different styles. Uh, Philip Lindsay is a lot to handle just because he's so small and shifty that he's hard to get a hand onto to bring down. So you're going to have to be really disciplined in, in the run game, which they've been in the last few weeks. They need to continue that. Uh, and then, yeah, you know, you can, again, kind of make Brandon Allen make those mistakes and then just feast off of them. One thing that they haven't done so far is forced turnovers. This seems like the game in which they should be able to do that. Yeah, I agree. Um, and sorry to interrupt you, but um, as long as they, you know, make make Allen and Denver as offense beat you, don't beat yourself. When they try to take those shots and, you know, knock it away, create turnovers, but, you know, avoid the penalties because don't give them any cheap yards that's going to set up scores for them and they should be okay. Right. So – a guy gets traded from a team. They be, they they become sellers at the deadline. What does that do to the to, to the chemistry? What does it do to your locker room? They still have eight games to play, and, and you're two and six. So it's not totally over. It's not looking ideal by any stretch. But what does that do to a to a locker room after you trade a, a guy that's a playmaker of of his caliber? You know, I always thought it was kind of awkward when it's just kind of an awkward time of year because, you know, it might be a guy in your room or, or somebody that you're close with on your side of the ball or, or a leader, you know, and, and there's certain guys that, you know, come up in those conversations that it sends a message to the team. It's like, well, maybe what direction are we headed in right now? Like you alluded to earlier, they're trading some of their key players and trying to acquire assets for the future. Well, what about the guys that are there now? They're trying to make a living now. So that's the thing. There's just because the message maybe upstairs is that we're thinking ahead, you know, the message downstairs in the locker room is, no, we want to win now. This is our livelihood. This is our job. So you're going to get a fiery team. I think guys usually rally behind behind their teammates. I, that's It's interesting because you did trade a playmaker and then you lose your starting quarterback, and now the injury report comes out and 13 guys are either not practicing or limited in practice, and it's like – are those injuries that – and I'm not saying guys should play through, but it, little nicks and scratches maybe that you would play through if you were 6-2 and two as opposed to 2-6. and six. I, I think we should also face the reality that this is these guys' livelihood, and they might not be fighting necessarily for the Broncos' future this year, but they are always fighting to put on good tape and earn a contract or earn an ability to play somewhere you else. You have to. Yeah. yeah. So and, I think they'll still be motivated. And they're also at week nine without a bye. Right now, also, and that that's where those injuries. We saw the Browns injury report a couple weeks ago before the bye week, where you were. I mean, it was impressive. Uh, looked like half the team. I mean, that's the impact of not having a bye yet. I, I don't know if did they get one the week after, or is it? It might be a couple weeks down the road. Or where it, it's, it's be a, the last they're just week. in a tough spot because they as as painful as this Brown season has been uh, with going two and five to this point and and being disappointed by some results, the Broncos has been equally tough if not worse because they were in so many close games to start the season and they were on the wrong end of basically all of them yeah. and they go back to sunday they were in last and, week yeah and their two yeah. their two wins were impressive i mean they they played really well in those two two games 
they played well enough to beat the Bears, didn't beat them. Obviously played well enough to beat the Colts, didn't didn't beat them. I mean, they they just been on the wrong end of a lot of these games. And, and you're hoping, uh, as someone who roots for the Browns, that you've caught them at a time where they just feel defeated. And yeah. maybe that's that's where you can hopefully take advantage. So you mentioned the bye week. It's next week. Okay. So this is your last one going into that bye week. There's a little bit of an element there as well. Yeah. And that division's still up for grabs right now. I, I think there's still a lot of football left to be played. In that AFC West, so I, I would expect you'll get a pretty good effort from Von Miller and company coming up on Sunday. Kickoff again at 425. On our side of things, the injury bug, uh, Demarius Randall, not looking positive like he's yeah. going to play this weekend. Uh, Eric Murray, uh, coach alluded to it today after his press conference, got dinged up yesterday and might end up being a little bit more severe. The, the secondary – continues to deal with some health issues. If it's if it's not one guy, it's another guy here in the secondary this year. Yeah, it's interesting. It's like the one area where you can afford injuries for some reason, that it just keeps having injuries. But it's like you without those guys, it's not ideal. You want them both on the field, but you've got options at both spots. TJ Carey didn't play much at all last week. Uh, he would be, I would imagine, the guy that goes and fills in for Murray in the slot. And then you had your mix of, of Whitehead, uh, maybe Murray was playing a little safety as well in that game, but also um, Morgan Burnett went from a guy that was playing about 15, 20 snaps to every snap against the Patriots. So it's good to have a veteran there that you can do that, and Justin Burris as well. So you've got options. It's not ideal. You want Demarius Randall on the field. You want Eric Murray on the field. But uh, I think against this specific team as well, I, I think you can weather it. Uh, but just hopefully these guys can get healthy soon. Yeah, and from an offensive standpoint, you know, you, you take a look and – Defensively, Gribble, you mentioned they played better last week uh, and did a, a continue to pro progress. And Olivier Vernon's playing well on the offensive side of the football. Just got to get some consistency and get rid of the mistakes, get rid of the penalties, get rid of the turnovers. John, I guess, how tough is it to change habits in the middle of a season? Well, I think it is tough because you know you work on you work on those things in, in camp and and all throughout the off season, but you know it's it, I'm not saying it's too late to change. I, I think they can. I think this the game that we're all wanting to see and that they're all expecting to play and they want to do as well. I think it's out there and I think we're going to see it here real soon because let's be honest, all of the we talked a little about a bit about the 50-50 balls or chances or things. It always seems to go the opponent's way. So I, I think you're going to see moving forward, potentially this week, where you're going to see a ball in the air and a 50-50 ball, and our guy's going to come down with it, whether if it, whether it's offensively or an interception. You know, I think that just some of these breaks, maybe calls, need to start going in our favor. And then and then we're on the flip side of it, talking about you know we're not we're not the team saying we got to eliminate those things. So I think it's out there, and as long as they keep their heads. On, you know, level and everything and moving forward, remaining positive, I think you're going to see that. I'll ask you this, though. How how dangerous or how tough can it be when you're in a locker room that might think it's getting the wrong end of a whistle and not letting that affect how you do things? It's tough, especially when when you feel like you're getting picked on, let's yeah. say, from the officials or something. You know, you don't want to go out there and create a bigger problem because those guys are human too. And, you know, a lot of those 50-50 things where, like for me, it was like, they might have been holding. The guy may look at you and say, I like that guy. I'm not going to throw it. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not saying they do that. But, you know, there's a lot of things that, you know, refs miss, and there's a lot of things they see that could have gone either way, and, and they end up throwing. And I think is if you just try to, you know, continue to play technique sound, emotionally sound football, you won't have to worry about it. I think you also made a good point earlier, too, that, that if you can get those parts down, there are things that you're doing that produces winning football, like running the football well. I mean, Nick Chubb's averaging over 100 yards a game. And he's, I think, I want to say he's leading the league or he's second in the league in yards per carry. I mean, this is a guy who's extremely consistent, who's carried the load on the ground, and you've been able to do this against some pretty good defenses as well. You know, last week, the number one defense overall. So if you can do that against another solid defense in Denver, but kind of control possession and limit the opportunities that they're going to have, and, and, also cut down on your own mistakes then you're going to put together a winning game and come away with a victory it's just a matter of doing all those things together at once and right now you're getting some and not the other ones you just need to put it all together well and you saw we know what you got in Nick Chubb one of the more dynamic playmakers right now in the National Football League um, you know we know we need to get Odell going and Jarvis and the receivers need to get in the end zone the tight end spots 
been the one catching all the touchdown passes. We got a good game Sunday from Baker Mayfield against the New England Patriots. Yeah, as good as you could have wanted. I mean, I I don't put that interception on him, and, no. but it was it was efficient. You weren't going to be taking big big chunks plays because of the weather, and he he did fine. It just was. You're he, playing from playing, behind play, in the blink of an eye, and he's and he's playing down in distance from behind a lot too because of the penalties. Yeah. You know, John, I want to ask you about this. On that play that resulted in the interception, um, Joel Batonio was tasked with guarding or blocking a guy who was in a much wider alignment than usual. How difficult is that on a play that requires so much timing and just snap, move the ball, get out, you know, and somebody's shooting that gap like that? It's it's difficult. And, you know, you don't know if they practice it against that look. So that's obviously a thing that you just kind of in your own mind and, and you're – kind of away from the building study or looking at you you kind of say okay what's my emergency plan if this happens and listen I I know Joel very well I know he had that contingency plan in in place and it was just one of those things I'm sure he thinks about it and it's still bothering him and I know he's going to come out this weekend and probably play his best game because I know he's going to want to erase that and show that that was just a freak thing but you know it's tough especially when you know a play is called and you're sitting there and you say this play the success of this play Really, if I do my job, it can make it go, and if I don't, it's going to be a bad one. And that's that's all the things. Great players make those plays, and he's a great player. So that's that's kind of a thing. I felt bad when I saw it because I know it was eating him up, but I know he's going to bounce back this week. And it, and it happens so quickly, too. It's a matter of if you can get a block for a second and a half or less, yeah. that maybe something like that can happen. Yeah, and if a guy's, uh, you know, if an alignment's different or if a defense is in a different alignment that you maybe be expecting, it's kind of a – you have to – you have a quick response and change your angle and change your steps, change your footwork. There's a lot of moving parts to it. And it just, you know, credit them. They had a, either a good scheme or a good uh, a key that, that maybe they were expecting it or saw it on tape or something and, and made a great play. I think the only one more thing I want to drive home about this that I've seen a lot of fans kind of ask about and the, in the conversation around that specific play, because, you know, obviously it goes viral on the Internet and everything else, um, was the idea that Baker had an opportunity to not toss that ball forward. In the design of that play, that's pretty much not a thing, right? Yeah, I, I think there's so much trust and timing associated with it that you're talking about less than split seconds. I mean, it's like a nanosecond that he has to react and get rid of that ball because if he holds on to it too long, it's a sack or a tackle for loss. If, if he throws it too early, it's a, it's a fumble. You know, So it's just a timing thing, as a lot of this offense is. And it's a thing that they practiced. It's a thing that looks great on during the week. And, you know, unfortunately, against the Patriots, it just didn't work out in their favor. So I think the timing has a lot to do with it. And Baker was doing his job. He was getting rid of the ball in a timely manner and it just, you know, fell into the wrong hands, unfortunately. All right, time now for our keys to a Browns victory. God knows. They need it. We need it. The fan base needs it. Everybody would like a victory Monday. <laughs> so with that being said, Gribble, I'll start with you. Give me – the biggest key to a Browns victory on Sunday. I'll go really simple so you guys can get in the details. If you score 20 points, I think if you score yeah. 20 points, you win this game. Okay. I, I think the Broncos have had a tough time getting, I think that the key number in Denver this year was 24. They haven't really hit that consistently. I mean, this is a team that hasn't scored much points to begin with. They play low scoring games. That's where they want to be uh, with you. They've got, uh, I think the Browns have a really good kicker. The Broncos have a really, really good one that is used to those the, those elements. In Denver, I know when we were there last year, we were not wanting to see him come out and attempt that last field goal at the Correct. end uh, before Jabril made that, that game-saving sack. Uh, so I think if you score 20 points, I think you win, and I think you win in a position where you're not sweating it out at the end. Do you need to get up early yes. in this game? Yeah, I mean, you can't play from behind against this defense. I mean, they're I they're still so. a really good defense. Somehow they're still really, really good without Bradley Chubb. And they – they it's a it's – a, I would say even though they have a new coach and apparently they're doing a lot different things, it's a cultural thing there that they have – they've just had a really good defense for about – seems like the last decade. They have a lot of experienced veterans on that defense too. They still have Chris Harris Jr., uh, Todd Davis is there, guys like Adam Gotsis. I mean, there's it's not just Von Miller. It's not just Bradley Chubb. And, and they're relying on that backbone. But I totally agree. You cannot play from a significant deficit. If you think last week was hard, well, actually, last week was probably still more difficult. But <laughs> let's, just, let's just say take the lesson from it's last week. Rough. Yeah. How, how, you know, how, how quickly did you feel like you were making an uphill climb there? Let's get rid of that and try and operate you know, on schedule and, and get ahead and then get a little more comfortable so you can play a little more freer. Yeah, I think um, it, I completely agree with you. And I think in order to do that, 
like to see maybe take a lot of shots and be really aggressive early. You know, take those big plays down the field. Like we were last year in the first quarter. Mm-hmm. Yes. So really just, you know, unload the playbook, all your deep, fun throws early. Try to get a, a, an early one. Or maybe a special teams or a big turnover in the red zone that, that uh, allows for an early score. Then put, the, put all the pressure on their new quarterback and let our guys maybe have a sack party at the end of the game. Then they can control the, the Browns can control the clock throughout the game with their r- rushing attack. So I really like to see them be ultra aggressive early. Try to get a cheap, uh, you know, maybe turnover or something that sets up a score and and uh, go from there. It's kind of a beautiful thing to consider because most games and especially a lot of the games that the Browns have had so far this year against very good opponents, mm-hmm. the, the one of the keys has always been you got to establish the run, you got to control possession. But to hear go out and get a score first and then kind of circle back to controlling possession, it's refreshing because it, it could create some excitement. Yeah, of did, course. Did you ever have to go up against Von Miller one on one in a situation where you uh, ended up having to go? Yeah, I think that they used to have a package where he lined up on the inside, and I know teams were starting to do that toward the end of my career, and I, I was kind of hoping that they waited until I was done. But <laughs> it makes sense because you know the tackles are they're built to block in space. They're a little bit more athletic. I hate to say that, and I know all the tackles are out there listening or <laughs> loving it, but uh, I hate to admit that. But, you know, you get your, your kind of star edge rusher, like when they move Miles inside or OV inside, you know, that makes guards nervous. I'm like, well, wait a second, why are you in here? G- you know, give me some, you know, big, giant, slow guy. And I know there's a lot of really athletic three techniques and, and defensive tackles, but I, I do remember going against him where they would kind of have a little package where he'd be inside and they'd have somebody else over the edge and they'd run twists and everything. So it, it creates a lot of havoc and maybe confusion because you're trying to ID people. You're like, why is this guy in here? So you might see it mix it up, but he's a great player. Your key, if you have one big key for a Browns win on Sunday. My key is to disrupt the quarterback on the defensive side and uh, at the end of the game, let's have let's see Miles Garrett have three sacks, four sacks. Let's see Ov have a have a you know big sack coming out party, and and let's just see everybody having fun work to where everyone on our sideline is smiling. It's a nice flight home. I'm Absolutely. in. I'm a big fan of that, especially because it'll be a late one. Yeah, as it always has been. <laughs> uh, Shook key to victory. I, I, this one I think is maybe the most obvious based on what we've been talking about all week, and it's just avoid the penalties, avoid shooting yourself in the foot, get out of your own way. And start to play the football that you've shown in spots that you can play. You showed it against Seattle early. I mean, you took that game by the throat and just didn't finish it off. So let's do that here uh, in Denver and uh, come away with a victory that everybody can be proud about and feel good about moving forward. I would love nothing more than in the third and fourth quarters to be handing the ball off to Nick Chubb Ah. and hand the ball off to Nick Chubb and – Hand the ball off, maybe to Dontrell Hood. Hey, let's take that <laughs> four, you know, f- plus four yards of carry and uh, and rack up some first downs and eat some clock, you know, yeah. with a lead. Big fan. One final thing: altitude. Is it a big deal? Is it not a big deal? Is it overblown? I always used to think that it was overblown, and I played out there uh, with my time in Cleveland, and we had like a really long opening drive, like twelve play. And I thought I was going to die when we went to the sidelines. So I think it was real. But I think as the time went on, you either stopped thinking about it or worrying about it or you were just tired from playing a game. So I think it is a, is a real um, real issue or concern only if you let it be. If you just go in there kind of expecting it and say, you know what, I'm going to have to adjust on the fly, I, I think you'll, everyone will be okay. Is it, is it like when you hear people talk about this who have gone and played you know basketball against the Nuggets or against the Broncos, they – a lot of them tend to say it's something that hits you early, like you just said. Is that mostly what you've heard from your teammates too? Yeah, I think so. And, and like I said, it could affect everyone differently. I don't know if you're, if you're from that part of the country, you know, if you're just used to it. But if you go out there, I don't know how long it takes your body to acclimate to it. Or I, I've heard that if you're, it, it, like you were saying, it affects you early. But I hear if you're out there for a day or two that you should be acclimated to it or adjusted to it. So we'll see how it goes. Hopefully it, it's not – you know, you never want to use it as an excuse as, as to, you know, why you're not winning the game. But as long as they can go out there and, and kind of let that some, be something that's been the back of their mind because they have a lot of other things that they should be focused on, I think they'll be okay. All right, that's going to wrap it up. We'll get you ready for Broncos. Browns coming your way on Sunday. The radio pregame show starts at 1230, kickoff at 425 with Jim Donovan, Doug Deacon, and Nathan Zagura on the University Hospital's Cleveland Browns Radio Network. Be sure to log on to clevelandbrowns.com or wherever you get your podcasts and like the best podcast available today. Give us a rating. Give us some feedback. 
as always, it is welcomed. For John Greco, for Andrew Gribble, for Nick Shook, I'm Jason Gibbs. This has been the best podcast of